Thank you so much for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Ephraim Graham. A federal judge blocks President Trump's new travel ban just hours before it was set to take effect. The president called the ruling unprecedented judicial overreach, and he vows to bring the case to the Supreme Court if necessary. George Thomas has the details. Speaking to supporters at a campaign-style rally in Nashville, President Trump said a judge's decision in Hawaii to halt his newly revised travel ban makes the country look weak and that he's working to protect Americans. We're going to fight this terrible ruling. We're going to take our case as far as it needs to go, including all the way up to the Supreme Court. We're going to win. We're going to keep our citizens safe. Calling it a watered-down version of his original executive order, the president says his decision to temporarily stop people from six Muslim-majority terror-prone nations from coming to this country is about national security, not discrimination. The best way to keep foreign terrorists, or as some people would say, in certain instances, radical Islamic terrorists, from attacking our country is to stop them from entering our country in the first place. But the judge disagreed, saying the new ban discriminates on the basis of nationality and religion, and cited, among other examples, President Trump's January 27th interview with CBN's David Brody, in which he discussed the need to protect Christians in the Middle East. Do you know, if you were a Christian in Syria, it was impossible, very, very, t at least very, very tough to get into the United States. If you were a Muslim, you could come in. But if you were a Christian, it was almost impossible. And the reason that was so unfair is that the, everybody was persecuted, in all fairness, but they were chopping off the heads of everybody, but more so the Christians. And I thought it was very, very unfair. So we are going to help them. The judge's ruling blocked the updated executive order just hours before it was to take effect. <laughs> Meanwhile, the battle over health care continues as the president and Republican lawmakers try to convince some members of their own party and the public that their proposals are good for the country. As Trump says, it's time to get rid of the failing Obamacare system. We will end this nightmare and put in place reforms that actually improve people's lives. The plan faces a big test today when the House Budget Committee deals with the legislation. Some Republicans have been unhappy with the new bill, calling it Obamacare light, arguing that it doesn't go far enough to undo Obamacare. But supporters say it's only the first step on the path to first repealing, then completely replacing Obamacare. The president says he's open to debate and negotiation to make sure they get the best plan for the American people. And more negotiations are sure to come in the days ahead. George Thomas, CBN News. UN Ambassador Nikki Haley rebuked the United Nations after it released a report calling Israel a racist and apartheid state. The report was co-authored by scholar Richard Falk, who is known for accusing America and Israel of being colonial empires. Haley calls the report anti-Israel propaganda and says the United States stands with our ally Israel and will continue to oppose bias and anti-Israel actions across the U.N. system and around the world. Haley also asked the U.N. to withdraw the report. For more on this story, simply head to CBNNews.com. This year, we have seen a lot of headlines about liberal protests at Republican town halls across the country. At first glance, it brings to mind the Tea Party uprising of 2010. But where is the Tea Party today? You may be surprised with the answer. CBN's David Brody reports now from Washington. USA! USA! The big Tea Party rallies from years ago may be gone, but the Tea Party itself is not. Nowadays, it takes different forms. Senator Ted Cruz. This week on Capitol Hill, hundreds of Tea Party patriots came to Washington to partner with Tea Party lawmakers. They're not happy with Republican leaders as they push Congress to make sure the GOP's Obamacare repeal and replace plan gets done the way they think it should. If Republicans take this opportunity and blow it, we will rightly be considered a laughing stock. The leadership in the House is weak-kneed and they are afraid 
They are afraid to lead with freedom and capitalism, so they're giving you something that's half as much as Obamacare, but doesn't fix the problems. The Tea Party transition over the years has three different components. First of all, most Tea Party groups are trying to affect change at the local level. The second component is happening right here in Washington, where the Tea Party stars of 2010 are now the national political players on the scene right here in D.C. Senators like Ted Cruz, Rand Paul, Mark Rubio, and Mike Lee were all powered into office by the Tea Party movement. And Donald Trump's outsider drain the swamp image played well with Tea Partiers too. Heritage Foundation President Jim DeMint is a card-carrying member of the original Tea Party. The two Republicans who came closest to winning the presidency were Cruz and Trump. DeMint sees a third and final component to the Tea Party's new appearance nowadays, they're looking a lot more like pro-Trump events. He's my, he's my man. Cloaked in good old fashioned patriotism. They're now called Spirit of America rallies and they're popping up all over America with a message. The Tea Party will not be silenced. We are that voice. We are that silent majority and we support Donald Trump. The Trump voters, a lot of those were Tea Party voters, evangelicals, and they were new uh, kind of Tea Party people coming out of blue collar, Iron Belt America, mm -hmm. union workers who were just tired of the baloney that Washington was giving them. And they thought maybe Trump had the power to kick down some doors mm -hmm. and make government work for them. The Tea Party's door kicking days are not over at all. But the headlines today are all about those liberal protests at GOP town hall. The mainstream media wants to compare this movement to the Tea Party. DeMint says it's night and day, arguing that the Tea Party was organically motivated, unlike these current events. But what you see with this, uh, this group on the left is well organized, is well financed. We've seen all their manuals of what to do. A lot of it's is George Soros funded and the Obama funded um, organization. That liberal megaphone has deep pockets. And while the Tea Party's megaphone isn't rich financially, it is rich in spirit and fight, transforming right before our very eyes. David Brody, CBN News, Washington. Snowstorm cleanup is underway in the northeast. Some parts of New York City got about seven inches of snow. Forecasters originally predicted the city would get closer to 18 inches. But New England was a different story there. That area saw about 30 inches of snow. At least 200,000 homes lost power across the Northeast and more than 6,000 flights were canceled. Coming up, how health and hope came to the neglected residents of an island in the Indian Ocean. Turning now to Iraq, the battle to drive ISIS from western Mosul continues, and now Iraqi and U.S. coalition forces say they have the terror groups around it. There is no way in or out of Iraq's second largest city. 50,000 people have fled Mosul in the past month. 750,000 remain, and ISIS fighters are using many of them as human, seal, human shields. Those who have escaped the clutches of the Islamic State say the group withheld food from them like sugar, rice, and cooking oil. So raises the question, will Islamic State terror disappear once ISIS is driven from Iraq and Syria? Recently discovered documents reveal ISIS plans to resume suicide bombings in Iraq. They also pledge to activate jihadist terror cells in the West. Thousands of Bangladeshi Muslims are leaving behind Allah and choosing Jesus. Bangladesh is the fourth largest Muslim nation in the entire world. Close to 20,000 Muslims have converted to Christianity in the last two years. Sources on the ground say people are converting so quickly, one day it could become a Christian nation. CBN News recently spoke to Jim Jacobson from Christian Freedom International to talk more about the situation. That Bangladesh is on the path to becoming a Christian nation in our lifetime because you see it growing house churches where one pastor is pastoring five or six churches. A pastor clique who used to be a police officer told me that in the Hill Tribe areas, that over the past two years, some 20,000 
Muslims have converted to Christianity. And, and that's just one example, one story, one testimony. And so something is going on. And it again, it's like a wildfire. Jacobson added many Muslim converts face violent persecution and rejection from their families, but say they refuse to give up their new faith. Christian missionaries, Christian missionaries travel to the far corners of the world to spread the gospel. Many places are simply dots on the, dots on the map that can be virtually inaccessible. But some places that used to take weeks or months to reach are now just an airplane ride away. That is, if you have a place to land. David Mim shows us how one Indonesian tribe made that happen and the Christian aviation group that came to visit. Missionaries came to the village of Mokodoma in Papua, Indonesia with a goal. Our goal here is to plant a church that can reach out and reach the rest of the Wano people. But first they needed to get the Wano missionaries there. And to do that, they needed an airstrip. It took them years, working mostly with shovels and sticks and backbreaking labor. Two years of work to get this thing done and to see the plane circling by the first time, it's just surreal, it's just like it's happening and he comes in and lands and you just feel the emotions, you know, it's so cool to have an airplane land, touch the ground. The plane belongs to Mission Aviation Fellowship. MAF serves people living in isolated areas where transportation or communication is difficult. They enable the work of some 1,500 churches, healthcare organizations, relief agencies, and mission groups. They deliver Bible translation teams. We're here to celebrate uh, the finishing of the, the complete Bible in the Hoopla language. So this is it. This is exciting stuff for us. We've been partnering with the missionaries that have been working to translate this thing for years and years and years. And so it's just great to be able to come and join them in the celebration. They fly mercy missions. This is Mika. He uh, was climbing in some trees yesterday with some other kids and he fell and a uh, branch impaled his abdomen. A man that was there finally noticed him and pulled that branch off and ran to our house. And uh, we could feel this piece of wood in there, you know, really like an inch, inch and a half long, really clear, just above where it had gone in. A frantic call for help was placed by shortwave radio to MEP. Lord, we just pray that the infection hasn't uh, set in and that uh, doctor can quickly take care of the issues and he and the family can come back here quickly. Uh, we put these things in your hands, in your name. Anyway. Mika and his family were flown to a hospital where doctors found that the wood had pierced both small intestine walls. He was rushed to surgery. In less than a week, Mika had recovered enough to be flown home. We're really thankful because if that wood stayed in there any longer, it could cause infection. Even another day or two could have made things much worse. Remember that airstrip we talked about earlier? Well, it's used to fly newly trained Wano missionaries to other parts of the island to share the word. These are my two good friends, Dugiru and Liku, and they're from our home village of Mokundama. They've become mature in their faith, and now they're down here in the lowlands in Iratoi, sharing the teaching, the good news to some of their relatives that live down here. Each year, MAF US serves more than 600 nonprofits, local government, and mission organizations all over the world. They enable ministries to provide isolated people with vital services and goods while sharing the love of Christ in a tangible way. Some call them God's Air Force. I'm David Mills, CBN News. Up next, whether they're liberal or conservatives, the members of the Supreme Court have this one thing in common. You'll see what it is and why it may be hurting the rest of America. The Supreme Court includes men and women, people of different races and religions, but they do have one thing in common. They all graduated from the same two law schools. Caitlin Burke has the story. When it comes to choosing a Supreme Court nominee, the Constitution doesn't include any checklist for qualifications, no guidance on age, birthplace, or education. What should matter is your approach to judging uh, and whether you are going to you know, interpret the law uh, with fidelity and apply it equally uh, to all people. Still, most high court resumes include an unspoken qualification, and that includes nominee Neil Gorsuch. 
Harvard and Yale graduates dominate the Supreme Court now and have a history of doing so. Raising questions about whether having a diploma from one of the nation's top two law schools is a prerequisite for the job. These are two excellent law schools uh, and that graduates from those law schools tend to go on uh, and have distinguished careers. John Malcolm oversees the Heritage Foundation's effort to increase understanding of the Constitution and the rule of law. Last year, he wrote about the Supreme Court vacancy and suggested eight candidates to replace Antonin Scalia. It was a diverse list, including names from a wide range of law schools and career paths. I think that uh, the president should cast a wide net in terms of looking for uh, qualified men and women. Five of his recommendations ended up on President Trump's shortlist, but in the end, he nominated Gorsuch, a Harvard grad who, if confirmed, continues the Ivy League domination. Some question whether such an elite group of individuals can represent the American people, having little in common with them. Malcolm says yes, primarily because they're meant to reflect the Constitution, not the public. It's not critical to the task of judging if what you're doing is you know, trying to figure out a law's meaning. But author Nicholas Lemon says judges often bring with them more than just a knowledge of the Constitution. The justices are very smart people and their official job is to interpret the Constitution. Um, so in theory, it's a, you know, technical job. But in practice, people bring life experience to it, um, ideological inclinations. Lemon also points out that even when disagreeing, current justices often think, write, and reason in similar ways because of their academic cultures. In order to find a different culture, we would need to go back to 1981, when President Ronald Reagan nominated Sandra Day O'Connor, a graduate of Stanford. Since then, it's been all Harvard and Yale. Lemon says this is because the cycle of Ivy League domination is self-perpetuating. It's a kind of enclosed world where everybody has a resume that looks pretty much the same, and, and uh, they tend to look for people like themselves to, you know, replenish the ranks. In fact, judges pretty much travel a similar path to make it to the high court. Here's a look at how they might go down that road. First, you would get a degree from only Harvard or Yale. Your next stop would be as a law clerk, followed by time in government service, like at a U.S. attorney's office. Follow that up with a stint teaching at a prestigious law school, and finally work as a lower court federal judge. It's best to avoid taking a job at political organizations like the ACLU or as a legal aid lawyer. Ruth Bader Ginsburg worked as a women's rights lawyer for the ACLU before her nomination to the federal bench. In 2011, she said that ACLU connection would probably disqualify her if she were put before the Supreme Court today. And Justice Clarence Thomas pointed out that no member of the Supreme Court comes from the heartland of America. Lemon says judges with impeccable backgrounds and uncontroversial careers are more likely to sail through the Senate. It seems that that's why President Trump picked uh, Neil Gorsuch to be his first Supreme Court nominee. It's not specifically that he went to an Ivy League school, but more that he, he would have an easy time in the confirmation process. But the Ivy League trend could be coming to an end. Donald Trump could likely appoint at least one more justice during his presidency, and he could choose one of the other finalists from his recent selection process. Judge William Pryor, who got his law degree from Tulane University in Louisiana, or Judge Thomas Hardiman, whose law degree comes from Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Either of those choices, or possibly even another, could give the Supreme Court a new diversity of experience, bringing in a justice from outside the halls of Harvard or Yale and from a different part of America. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, New York. And stay with us. There's more of CBN News Watch straight ahead. Time now for your Thursday Thankful, and today I hope you will join me in this prayer of gratitude. Father, I thank you for the giants in my life. I realize they are not here to destroy me. You have created me to overcome the giants. Remember, with God, you are greater than any mountain or giant, visible or invisible. With that word, make this a thankful Thursday. 
That will wrap it up for this edition of CBN News Watch. Remember, you can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about always at CBNNews.com. And we would love to hear what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can do that first by emailing newswatch at CBN.com. You can also reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'd love to hear from you. Hope you'll join us again right here next time. It is Thursday. Make it a thankful one. We'll see you right back here, same time, tomorrow.